Welcome back. Go ahead and suffocate the like button. Stick around until the end to see our next disturbing story you can't afford to miss. In the sprawling expanse of the once thriving industrial district of Old Crow, there lay a series of abandoned factories that had once been the heart of the town's economy. Now, they stood as decrepit monuments to a bygone era, their stories lost to time and decay. Among urban explorers, the factories were legendary, said to be a treasure trove of forgotten machinery and ghostly echoes of the past. Dexter, a seasoned urban explorer with a popular YouTube channel dedicated to his nocturnal adventures, had always been drawn to places that others would avoid. The allure of Old Crow's industrial district, with its tales of eerie happenings and unexplained disappearances, was irresistible to him. He planned an overnight exploration, aiming to capture footage for his next big video release. Equipped with a high-quality camera, a sturdy flashlight, and various other gear, Dexter made his way to the largest of the factories, an old textile mill known as the Spindle. Local lore suggested that the Spindle was haunted by the spirits of workers who had tragically died in a fire during the 1950s, their souls forever entwined with the charred remains and twisted steel. As Dexter approached the looming structure, the sun began to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows that seemed to reach out towards him. The air grew colder as he entered through a broken side door, the smell of rust and burnt wood heavy in the air. Inside, the factory was a cavernous space, with collapsed ceilings and floors littered with debris. Graffiti covered the walls, some of it fresh, indicating that others had ventured here recently. Dexter began his exploration, his camera rolling, narrating his observations for his audience. He wandered through the expansive looms and machinery, some still standing as if waiting for workers to return. As he delved deeper into the mill, he heard a soft noise, a repetitive thump that seemed out of place in the still air. Curious, he followed the sound, finding that it grew louder and more distinct as he approached the back of the factory where the old workers' lockers were located. The thumping led him to a specific locker, its door slightly ajar and shaking as if someone or something were trying to open it from the inside. Dexter, adrenaline surging through his veins, carefully pulled the door open. To his shock, a cascade of old, moth-eaten worker uniforms spilled out. But amidst the fabrics, there lay a small, intricately carved box that seemed wildly out of place. Intrigued, Dexter picked up the box, examining its fine details and strange symbols. He couldn't shake the feeling that he was meant to find this, like it had been waiting for him. Eager to discover its contents, he gently pried it open, revealing a set of old yellowed papers and a peculiar metallic object that resembled a compass, its needle spinning wildly. As soon as the box was opened, a palpable change swept through the factory. The air turned icy and the faint sounds of the past, clattering looms, distant shouts, began to fill the vast space. Dexter felt a rush of cold air pass through him, chilling him to the bone. The camera's light flickered erratically, and the compass's needle spun faster, as if caught in a tempest. Realizing that he might have disturbed something otherworldly, Dexter decided it was time to leave. He packed the box, planning to research it later, and made his way back to the entrance. However, as he retraced his steps, he found that his surroundings had subtly changed. Paths that should have led back to the entrance now circled back on themselves, leading him deeper into the bowels of the factory. The realization hit him with chilling clarity. The factory didn't want him to leave. The whispers grew louder, an unintelligible cacophony that seemed to echo from the walls themselves. Dexter pushed forward, his flashlight's beam flickering over the shifting shadows that danced just beyond his sight. As he navigated the labyrinthine factory, the night's exploration was far from over, and the true nature of the spindle's haunting was only beginning to reveal itself. As Dexter ventured deeper into the twisting corridors of the spindle, the whispers morphed into desperate, gasping cries that seemed to emanate from the very walls. He kept his camera rolling, hoping to document what might be his most profound discovery, or his last. Every step brought an increase in the spectral cacophony and an oppressive sense of dread that clawed at his mind. The factory seemed to warp around him, hallways stretching and contracting unnaturally, machinery rustling to life in brief, startling moments as if ghosts of the old workers operated them from the shadows. Dexter realized he was no longer navigating by his own will. 
The factory was hurting him, guiding him through forgotten passages and sealed rooms that hadn't seen light in decades. Eventually, Dexter came upon a vast chamber, the heart of the factory, where the remnants of old looms stood in a perfect circle around a central platform. As he stepped into the center, the noises stopped abruptly, plunging him into a suffocating silence. The air was thick with the scent of burnt fabric and metal and something else, something foul and cloying. On the platform lay a pile of old charred timbers and machinery parts, arranged in a meticulous, ritualistic pattern. Among these remains, the compass in his hand began to spin wildly again, the needle oscillating as if caught in a magnetic storm. Dexter, driven by a mixture of fear and compulsion, placed the compass on the platform. As he did, the ground beneath him trembled, and the air shimmered with a ghostly light. Shadows detached from the darkness, coalescing into the forms of the factory workers who had died in the fire. Their spectral forms were twisted with the agony of their last moments, their eyes hollow pits of despair. They converged on Dexter, their hands reaching out, not in malice but in pleading desperation. The leader of the specters, a woman with her hair still smoldering with ethereal flames, stepped forward. Her voice was a mournful echo of life, filled with unbearable sorrow. Free us, she whispered, her eyes locking onto Dexter's. Break the cycle. Understanding dawned on Dexter. This ritual, the compass, his presence, it was all preordained. He was meant to find this place, to end their suffering. With trembling hands, he took the compass and noticed a small engraving on the side, a directive that seemed to provide a clue. Reverse the path to mend the circle. Mustering every ounce of courage, Dexter rotated the compass, forcing the needle to spin in the opposite direction. As he did, the spectral light grew blinding, the air screamed with the release of decades of trapped energy, and the spirits began to dissolve into motes of light, their faces expressions of relief and peace. But as the factory's curse lifted, the structure, long supported by the spectral presence, began to collapse. Dexter ran, dodging falling debris as the building succumbed to gravity, ancient timbers and bricks cascading around him in a deadly deluge. He burst from the collapsing factory just as the roof caved in, throwing himself into the underbrush as clouds of dust and ash billowed into the night sky. Lying there, panting and covered in soot, Dexter looked back at the ruins of the spindle. It was over. The spirits were freed, but the factory was no more. His camera, miraculously still intact and recording, had captured everything. Dexter knew this footage was his most important yet. It was more than evidence of paranormal activity. It was a testament to the souls he had helped release. As the first rays of dawn crept over the horizon, Dexter stood and made his way back to civilization, the weight of his experiences heavy in his heart. The factory's destruction marked an end to the haunting, but for Dexter, the memories of that night would linger, a haunting of a different kind, etched forever into his soul. Elliot had always been captivated by the stories embedded in forgotten places. His passion for urban exploration had led him through abandoned hospitals, desolate schools, and vacant hotels, each location contributing to his growing collection of eerie photographs and chilling videos. One day, while scouring an online forum for new places to explore, he stumbled upon a mention of the Holloway Sanatorium, a sprawling psychiatric hospital shuttered in the late 80s after a mysterious fire claimed part of its structure. According to local legend, the sanatorium was haunted by the patients who were trapped in the fire, their spirits now wandering the charred ruins and echoing corridors, crying out for help that never came. Intrigued and undeterred by the stories, Elliot saw an opportunity for a thrilling exploration that could offer his followers some sensational content. He arrived at Holloway on a dreary Thursday afternoon, the overcast sky and a gentle drizzle setting a somber mood. The sanatorium was hidden behind a veil of overgrowth, its once majestic facade now marred by time and neglect. Vines climbed up the crumbling walls, and broken windows gaped open like dark, unseeing eyes. With his camera equipment and flashlight in hand, Elliot breached the perimeter fence and made his way inside. The main hall was vast, with flaking paint and debris scattered across the floor. His flashlight beam cut through the darkness, casting long shadows that seemed to flicker and move as he passed. As he ventured deeper, his camera captured the oppressive atmosphere, the silence punctuated only by the sound of dripping water and his own footsteps. Elliot explored several rooms, 
finding remnants of the past, rusted bed frames, overturned chairs, and faded paintings that hung askew on the walls. It was in the east wing, untouched by the fire, where he found the patient records room. Files and papers were strewn about, and as he sifted through them, he felt a chill run down his spine. The records spoke of experimental treatments and failed therapies, the desperation of the doctors mirrored in the increasingly frantic notes. As he read, Elliot heard a soft thud from the corridor outside. Assuming it was just a small animal, he ignored it and continued his exploration. However, the sounds persisted, growing louder and closer, until it was clear they were footsteps. Frozen, Elliot listened as the footsteps stopped right outside the door of the records room. Heart pounding, he called out, Hello? Is someone there? No answer came, just a sudden deafening silence. Gripping his camera more tightly, Elliot slowly approached the door and peered out into the hallway. His light revealed nothing but the empty, decaying corridor. Relieved yet uneasy, Elliot decided to head toward the section damaged by the fire, hoping to conclude his exploration and leave before dark. As he navigated through the damaged part of the sanatorium, the air grew noticeably colder and the smell of charred wood and something faintly acrid filled his nostrils. The fire-damaged walls were blackened, the structures unstable and eerie. He reached what had once been the patient's living area, where the fire had been most intense. Here, the atmosphere felt different, thicker, as if charged with a silent, waiting energy. Elliot's camera suddenly flickered and went dead, despite having a full battery when he'd entered. As he fumbled with it, trying to restart it, the faint sound of whispering filled the room. It was indistinct at first, but gradually it became clearer. Don't look! Don't see! The voices hissed, a cacophony of despair that seemed to emanate from the very walls around him. Elliot, heart racing with fear and curiosity, knew he should leave, but felt compelled to stay, to understand what was happening. As he stood there, the whispers grew louder, and a cold wind swept through the room, blowing papers and dust in swirling eddies around him. The sanatorium, with its tragic past and restless spirits, was not yet done with him. The story of Holloway was unfolding, revealing its dark heart to Elliot, who suddenly realized that he might have delved too deeply into a world that should have remained forgotten. Elliot, now caught in the eye of a spectral storm, felt an overpowering urge to flee, but his feet refused to move, rooted to the spot by a mixture of fascination and terror. The whispers morphed into discernible voices, pleas for help, cries of pain, and the angry shouts of the doomed. They swirled around him like a chorus of the damned, each voice more agonizing than the last. The temperature dropped so sharply that Elliot's breath became visible in the air, forming misty clouds that seemed to be swallowed by the darkness. He struggled with his camera again, desperate to document this phenomenon, but the device remained dead, its screen as black as the scorched walls around him. Suddenly, the whispers stopped. Silence slammed down with an almost physical force, making Elliot's ears ring. He blinked, his eyes straining in the darkness, and that's when he saw them, figures emerging from the shadows, their forms blurry and distorted as if viewed through water. They moved slowly towards him, their movements jerky and unnatural. Paralyzed with fear, Elliot could only watch as they approached. The figures were ghastly, burned and mutilated, their features twisted in expressions of eternal suffering. The air around them shimmered with a strange, ethereal light, casting eerie glows on their faces. One, a woman with hollow eye sockets, reached out to him, her hand a charred claw. Elliot's survival instincts finally kicked in, and he turned to run, his feet pounding on the cold floor as he raced back through the corridors. He could hear them behind him, their whispers loud again, filling the sanatorium with chilling sounds. He didn't dare look back fearing that seeing them again would freeze him in place. He burst out of the sanatorium, gasping for breath, the fresh air feeling like a lifeline. He didn't stop running until he reached his car, fumbling with the keys before finally managing to unlock it and dive inside. He started the engine and sped away, not stopping to catch his breath until the sanatorium was nothing but a distant shadow behind him. Once home, Elliot was racked with trembling and cold sweats, unable to rid his mind of the horrors he'd witnessed. He knew he'd left a part of himself back in those haunted halls, captured by the tortured souls who'd reached out to him. Sleep eluded him, and when it finally came, it brought no rest. Only nightmares filled with flames, and faces twisted in agony. The next day, 
A deep sense of dread compelled him to return to the sanatorium. He couldn't explain why. He knew it was madness to go back, but something unspoken and unresolved was pulling him there. As he approached the charred remains of the sanatorium under the gray morning sky, Elliot felt an overwhelming sensation of being watched. The building loomed silent and foreboding, its windows like dark, empty eyes. As he stepped closer, the air around him began to cool, and the whispers returned, faint at first, but growing louder with each step he took. Frozen by an unseen force, Elliot could only watch in horror as the air in front of him shimmered and the spectral figures from the night before appeared once again. This time, they were clearer, more solid, as if they had drawn strength from his fear. We warned you, the woman with hollow eyes hissed, her voice echoing in Elliot's mind. You saw, you did not heed. The other spirits closed in, their burnt hands reaching for him, their cries filling the air. Elliot screamed, but it was drowned out by the cacophony of their voices. As their hands touched him, he felt a searing pain, and his world went black. When the police found Elliot's camera amid the ruins of Holloway Sanatorium days later, it was still recording. The footage was a jumble of shadows and sounds, incomprehensible and chilling. Elliot himself was never found, his fate a mystery that would fuel the legends of Holloway for years to come. He had sought the truth of the sanatorium, only to become another ghost story, whispered about in the flickering light of campfires by those who dare to explore the darker side of history. In the sprawling outskirts of a forgotten town lay the remnants of what once was the Greystone Mental Hospital. Built in the early 20th century, it had been abandoned since the 70s, left to decay silently amidst overgrown vegetation and the relentless passage of time. The hospital held a notorious reputation, steeped in tales of unethical treatments and the mysterious disappearances of several patients, which made it a prime target for the bravest of urban explorers. One such explorer was Marcus, known in the urban exploration community for his daring solo adventures into some of the country's most haunted and forsaken sites. Armed with his camera, a powerful flashlight, and a healthy dose of skepticism about the paranormal, Marcus planned an overnight exploration of Greystone. His followers were buzzing with excitement over the live stream he promised, one that would delve into the darkest corners of the hospital's forgotten wards. Marcus arrived at Greystone on a cloudy night, the moon occasionally peeking through the racing clouds, casting eerie shadows on the hospital's imposing facade. The building was a colossal structure of crumbling brick and broken windows, its once grand architecture now marred by graffiti and the scars of time. As he approached the main entrance, the air grew noticeably colder, a common enough occurrence in old buildings, he reminded himself, yet it did little to ease the chill that settled in his bones. Inside, the hospital was a labyrinth of corridors, each turn and doorway promising both danger and discovery. Marcus's flashlight pierced the darkness, revealing peeling paint, collapsed ceilings, and remnants of furniture. As he ventured deeper, his camera captured everything, broadcasting the silent, oppressive atmosphere of the hospital to his viewers. They watched with bated breath, their screens lighting up with comments of both concern and morbid curiosity. After exploring several patient rooms and nursing stations littered with debris and old medical equipment, Marcus descended into the basement. It was said that the hospital's most controversial treatments had been administered below ground, away from public scrutiny and the light of day. The air grew damp and heavy as he walked down the decrepit stairwell, the faint odor of antiseptic still lingering after decades. The basement was a network of narrow, twisting passages. The farther Marcus ventured, the more disoriented he became. The layout didn't match any of the old blueprints he had studied before his visit. It was as if the hospital had grown its own new arteries and veins, reshaping itself far away from the prying eyes of the world. As he navigated the maze-like basement, Marcus heard a noise, a soft, repetitive thumping that seemed to come from behind the walls. Curious and a bit unnerved, he followed the sound to a heavy metal door that was slightly ajar. Beyond it lay what appeared to be an old operating theater. The surgeon's gallery rose, filled with shadows. Pushing the door open, Marcus stepped inside, his camera sweeping across the room. That's when he saw it. An old film projector, inexplicably running, 
casting flickering images on a tattered pull-down screen. The film showed grainy, black-and-white footage of what he could only assume were the hospital's psychiatric treatments. Patients in distress, doctors in outdated medical garb, strange and now-forbidden therapies. As he approached the projector, fascinated by its persistence and the chilling scenes it displayed, the footage began to change. Now, it showed a room, a room that looked remarkably like the one he was standing in. The camera angle was from the back of the theater, and it slowly panned forward, towards a lone figure standing where Marcus was now. Heart pounding, Marcus turned to look behind him, half expecting someone or something to be there. But he was alone, or so it seemed. When he turned back to the projector, the film had changed again. Now it displayed the operating table in the center of the room, and a figure was strapped down to it, struggling against restraints. A chill ran down Marcus's spine as he realized the figure on the table bore an uncanny resemblance to himself. The projector flickered, and the film went blank for a moment before restarting from the beginning. As the familiar footage resumed, Marcus heard the door he had entered through slam shut, echoing throughout the empty theater. The hospital, with its secrets long buried in its walls, was not done with him yet. Marcus's night at Greystone Mental Hospital was far from over, and the true horror of what lay within its walls was only beginning to reveal itself. Marcus's heart raced as he stared at the door that had just slammed shut with no discernible cause. Panic surged through him, his instincts screaming for him to flee, but the deep curiosity that had driven him to this place now rooted him to the spot. He turned back to the projector, its beam slicing through the darkness and flickering images that eerily mirrored the room's reality. A whisper of movement caught his attention, a shadow shifting subtly in the corner of the room. Marcus pointed his flashlight toward it, his hand trembling. The light revealed nothing but empty chairs and the peeling paint of the walls. The shadow, however, did not disappear. It seemed to absorb the light, remaining impenetrable and opaque. Marcus's mind raced to rationalize what his eyes were seeing. But deep down, he knew he was facing something unexplainable. Determined to not let fear overwhelm him, Marcus approached the projector again, intent on turning it off and stopping the haunting film. As he reached for it, the machine sputtered and whirred louder, as if resisting his attempts. With a forceful push, he switched it off, plunging the room into silence, broken only by his heavy breathing. The silence, however, was short-lived. From the darkness of the gallery above, the sound of slow, deliberate applause echoed through the room. The clapping was cold and mocking, resonating with a timbre that chilled Marcus to his core. He spun around, shining his light up towards the source of the sound, but the gallery was empty. The applause stopped abruptly, replaced by a low, guttural whisper that filled the room. You shouldn't have come here. The temperature dropped, breath visible in the air, and Marcus felt an unseen force grip him, a pressure that was both chilling and suffocating. Panic set in fully now, his earlier resolve crumbling as the true danger of his situation became undeniable. He needed to get out, needed to escape the oppressive evil that had awakened within these walls. Stumbling back to the door, he pulled with all his might, but it remained firmly shut. The whispers grew into voices, dozens of them, all speaking at once in a cacophony of despair and anger. They filled the theater, swirling around him, words indecipherable, but their intent horrifyingly clear. They were not going to let him leave. In desperation, Marcus picked up a chair and threw it at a nearby window. The glass shattered, offering a rush of fresh air and a sliver of hope. He clambered through the broken window, cutting himself on the shards but hardly feeling the pain in his frantic escape. Outside, the grounds of the sanatorium were shrouded in mist, the world beyond the hospital's perimeter seemingly miles away. Marcus ran without direction, driven by primal fear, his only thought to put as much distance as possible between himself and the hospital. Behind him, the whispers of the sanatorium faded into the distance, but their chilling effect lingered, a haunting reminder that some places are better left unexplored. Marcus's escape from the hospital was frenzied and blind, the forest around the sanatorium seeming to close in on him as he ran. Branches clawed at his clothes and skin, roots tripped him, but he kept going, driven by an overwhelming fear of what lay behind. When he finally emerged from the tree line, the first light of dawn was touching the sky, its pale light a stark contrast to the darkness he had fled. 
Breathing heavily, Marcus looked back one last time at the silhouette of the Greystone Mental Hospital. It stood there, a dark monument to past horrors, silent now, but he knew better. He had felt its malevolence, experienced its haunting power. He knew he would never return, could never return. The footage he had hoped to capture was forgotten, left behind in the rush of survival. All he carried with him now were the scars of the night and a story that he could scarcely believe himself. A story that he would struggle to share, for fear of it drawing him back to that dark place or worse, awakening it further. As Marcus walked away, the sun rising behind him, he knew his days of exploring abandoned places were over. Some mysteries, he realized, are best left unsolved, their secrets too dangerous to unearth. His adventure at Greystone had ended, but the echoes of that night would haunt him forever, a chilling reminder that some horrors are all too real. Thank you for listening. Now watch this video.